welcome everyone. We are super excited to be with you all. Session four. We've been together for a little while now. I feel like I'm starting to get to know you all. I know who's like jumping on and love seeing everybody's face. And we have to give you double, triple kudos for coming back so quickly after our last meeting as we try to really bring this work to life. We realize we do a lot in the session, but then we ask you to do a lot afterward. And I was super pumped to see, um, you know, you all record your next set of Uncover protocols and go on and keep the work going and, and check in with us. It's just been really nice to see you all just going in so deep. So we're really appreciative of you. And today we are going to start thinking about this idea of reimagine. And when we think about this idea, we want to be in the spirit of transformation. And so to start us out, before I get into our goals and intentions and all that, I would love if Shane would just read a quote from Street Data, if you have it, page 75, about the spirit of today's session. So this is the second paragraph on page 75, and it is isolating the word transformation within the cycle that we're all moving through and kind of reflecting on why that word. First, a note on the word choice of transformation. It pains me to select a noun here. I agonized over the sound of inquiry, improvement, and change, but ultimately landed on transformation. As I write this, I hear the words of my colleague and friend, Denise Augustine, in my ear. Denise, a leader for Indigenous education with the Ministry of Education in British Columbia, firmly rejects the term improvement as connoting incremental change in the face of generational challenges. Improvement feels like we are tinkering around the edges of systemic realities that trace back to slavery, restrictive immigration laws, Native American genocide and dispossession, and centuries of exclusionary policy. We don't really need improvement. We need an approach that fundamentally and radically transforms the experiences of children and families at the margins. This is the purpose of centering street data in a process of transformation. Thank you for that, Shane. Every time you read something from the book, I'm like, dang, who wrote that? That's really amazing. <laughs> and then I'm like, oh yeah, wait, I know this person. Anyway, thank you for reading that truly because I think what it captures is what we are trying to get away from and step into today and what we've really been trying to step into this entire time, which is not just pushing on the edges, but really full body change that gets us at meeting the needs of our kids in the ways we say we want to. And so with that, we have a couple of intentions trying to bridge together what you all have been doing to where we're going. So the first is we wanna create some space to reflect on the impact of our work thus far. You all did some more uncovering over the last few days and week. And so we wanna give you a chance to say, now that I've done this listening, now that I've been doing some of this uncover work, how has that changed me or transformed me? What am I wrestling with? What am I sitting with now? We also want to use your street data reflections to identify an aspect of your practice we want to reimagine. And so some of this relates to the flip grid that you started on. It's okay if you didn't finish, but we've started to ask you to think about where am I going to shift my, my practice given all of this? We want to start to kind of think about that. And we want to help you all use a, uh, a strategy um, to kind of bring that work to life. And so we're gonna actually be introducing um, co-generative dialogues today. And so in that we will be developing a set of design principles or pulling out some design principles, but really that outcome needs to shift. We're gonna be introducing you all to, to a tool to help you reimagine based on your street data reflections. So given that, what I would love is if we could call in our witnesses for the day. We had a really um, nice witnessing last time. I feel like you all really pushed the group with how you all reflected. And so I'm curious from both of our schools, who uh, wants to be a witness? I know we had Winter last time and we had Aaron last time. So who's going this time? Uh, I'm gonna be the witness for, from BBHM. Thank you, Anna. Ali, say, were you supposed to be the, you were the second person last, like the backup from winter. Is that right? I was gonna say, I can be the witness again, if that's okay, but I don't have to if somebody else wants to. I can do it. Thank you, Sarah. 
All right, and just a reminder that what we want our witnesses to do is to really be in the embodiment of the experience. You can think about what you noticed in terms of very technical things. You can think about and talk about your experience or the feelings that you saw come up for people. Really, you're like the storyteller and the holder of the narrative in this space or things that you've noticed. Um, and, and bringing that together in narrative for this space. So whatever comes up is fine. Also wanna just give uh, a reminder of our agreements as we go into the space and start to talk and work with each other. Just take a look at those. I'm not gonna narrate them, but I want you to identify if there's one you really feel like you're gonna need to step into given our focus on reimagine. Were you able to identify one to lean into? All right, great. So we wanna give you a chance, as we said, to reflect on this work up to date. And Shane read this lovely quote around um, transformation and improvement. And I love this little uh, image that says, a significantly improved caterpillar still remains a caterpillar. To become a butterfly, it needs to go through transformation. And you all have been going through a process with us around that. And so we wanna give you an opportunity across the teams to reflect on this work that we've been doing and in what ways you are beginning to be transformed in your heart, your mind, your spirit, and your practice. We're gonna give you a minute or so to reflect on that prompt. And then Shane is going to put you into breakout pairs as I get ready to put myself on mute and sneeze. So you'll have a minute to reflect on that prompt and then we will put you all in pairs before we jump in further. Okay, in this pair, you will be able to talk two minutes each um, and you don't necessarily have to do it in the way of a dyad where you can't speak, but just give each person generally two minutes and then if you have more time, you guys can continue to chat. Um, so we would love to hear, this was a big question around how you all are beginning to be transformed in doing this work in all these different areas of yourselves. And we're curious if anyone is willing to share your thoughts. I can share. Um, Araceli, BBHM, y'all. Um, for myself, it's so, I've been in education for many years. I've been teaching kindergarten five, but overall in all fields of education, it's been over 13 and I've done most every role in teaching and I love it. Um, but the last few years have been hard and coming back into this year, uh, it's, I feel like I'm rusty in remembering all the things that I did as an educator. And um, you know, the other day I pulled my three students to interview them and they were so happy to have this one-on-one -on -one time with me. And every single student wanted to be interviewed. And it just gave me a pause that I'm like, this is really that first time this year I've been able to have one-on-ones for anything other than an assessment. This was just a conversation with my kiddos and they wanted that one-on-one -on -one time with me and it's important. And how do I remember that this is why I became a teacher is these little friends and their voices. Um, so it just reminded me like, I need to go back to the heart and I need to go back to these interviews early on in the year. Like we wanna get to know these kiddos other than these, all the assessments we have to give them. Um, and I was, I was really grateful and it was nice to be able to create that space to have that one-on-one -on -one time. I saw a lot of heads nodding as you were sharing. So thank you, thank you so much for, for bringing that into the space. Um, I think that something that I noticed for myself, but also in conversation is that, um, just the transformations that are already occurring with just the little pieces that I'm already, um, you know, uncovering as we work through the protocols and the discussions and stuff and how that is already changing uh, some of the practice that's happening in the work that I do. And I think the work that other people are doing. So I really appreciate that, that, um, you know, it's not until the end, it's like starting now. I'll jump in. Um, and now short-term memory loss, Ra Raphael, am I correct on that? Please tell me I didn't get his name wrong. 
thumbs up. Good. Good. Yes, good, lovely. We just talked about um, kind of this just new level of awareness of bias and how it's um, it's been kind of humbling, but then also it's I've noticed an actual like mental shift and a change in just how my brain is actively functioning from moving from assumption and judgment to now like stopping thinking and processing. And I think I'm becoming a better listener. I think, I think. I mean, I have to imagine that's the best part we can all take, right? <laughs> it's becoming better listeners. And Shane and I used to laugh and say how uh, we realized we had a lot of areas in our lives to get better at listening after doing this uh, work and hopefully we're better partners and, and parents for it. So thank you for sharing Jessica Winter and Edicelli. We really appreciate that. And we know that there's a lot of transformation happening across everybody in this group. So we thank you. And for us, I wish you, we, you all can know all the design work you all are inspiring. So today we are going to focus on reimagine, as I said, and I think it's important to just set the stage a little bit um, by defining this whole idea. And so, as you all know, we've gone through listen, we've gone through uncover, and now is where we take this and we start to get creative and energized and start to really think, what can we do with this information that our babies or our young people have shared with us? And so I'm using a couple of different pages um, in the book. The whole section around reimagine it starts on page 88, but I wanna pull out a couple of things from the idea of reimagining. So I'm starting here on page 89 and I'm just pulling a couple of pieces. So you don't need to know every piece, but I'm gonna start with this last um, two paragraphs. So it says the reimagined phase is about inquiry with those at the margins, not inquiry for, which can default into dangerous types of paternalism or white saviorism. The powerful approach of participatory action research can support our efforts here by empowering marginalized community members to learn and apply research techniques in order to uncover innovative solutions to community challenges. What's important here is that we are working with those we have now listened to, to figure out what we can do to address the challenges that they have brought up. And in that, we have to remember that the words are reimagined meaning no idea is too far out there. This is when our brains, our hearts, our spirits get really big. And we're thinking about this, not only in a dream space, but almost like an action research space where we're gonna try things that are really exciting to us. We're gonna see if they work. We're gonna try a little bit of, uh, again. And we're really gonna go with this mindset of creativity. Another thing I want to mention, though, in this space of reimagine is what you can find on page 90 at the bottom, where it says this, the biggest pitfall at this stage is reverting to the same strategies you've been using because they're familiar, comfortable, or don't shake the table. At the reimagine phase, the rubber meets the road as you move from analyzing street data toward action. It can be incredibly seductive to stay the course with past practices, even dysfunctional ones. So the note I'm just cautioning us with is that we can get to reimagine. This actually happened with us in the very beginning. Like, yes, I want to do this. I want to radically transform. And let me just push on the edges because that's the easy thing to do. We really want to be conscious of this as we start to get into some of these ideas, especially a pretty bold one that Shane is going to bring up. So hopefully that gives you all a little bit of sense of like the spirit and some of the questions Shane already um, has in here. This is from page 91 in this section. Some of the questions that might be grounding us are things like in what new directions do the root causes begin to point us toward or what creative ideas and approaches are naturally emerging from our data and dialogue. And I like to just think of that as more of like the flow piece, not the like stretching way over here, but like what's just coming up for us? Like, what could we try? What could we do? Really exciting and spirit of creativity. So to do that, to kind of slow walk us into that, we want to think about first design principles that we might hold when we're thinking about reimagining. And Shane wrote this book called The Listening Leader a while ago that I actually like to think about few simple rules and design principles from. And so just to define this, design principles can be simple principles to guide our actions, decisions, and ways of being. It can be really easy to go like, just make everything very difficult and complex, 
when really what can be powerful and guiding us is simple things that we just want to hold on to as we're operating in this work. And so you're going to get a chance to see a teacher doing some reimagining with her kids. But really, in this first example, we want you to think about or be able to pull out the design principles, the ways of being she might be committed to as she's doing the reimagining phase with her children. When you watch this clip, you're going to have the opportunity in your teams to kind of think about what you saw and see if you can derive two to three design principles that she may uh, have had with her kids. Or I think the opposite, maybe. I think they're actually gonna pull them gonna out. Share out. Yeah, well, share them out. And then go create. Design. And then create them, my apologies. All right. <laughs> you to say a word about the video? Yes, please do. Okay, y'all, so this video is fresh off the press. It is still being edited, in fact. So you all are frontline viewers. Um, we I linked into your homework the YouTube link where this is uploaded because we're going to ask you to watch. It's only 12 minutes long, but we don't have time to show all of it. We're going to show three short clips during the session today and then an, uh, request that you watch it all because um, it's kind of instructive around this process um, as part of your homework. But just to set the stage for what you're going to see now, this is Gwen Larson. Um, she is a dear friend of mine and a veteran teacher in Long Beach Unified School District, so in Southern California. Um, this is, she's with five students from a ninth grade class, English class that she teaches. And um, this part you're watching, it is part of a co-generative dialogue, and we'll come back to that a little bit later and unpack it. But I don't want you, at this point, we don't really want you to worry about the technicality of like the process so much as just, as Jamila said, like noticing how she shows up. What are her ways of being and are there kind of invisible principles that you think are informing how she moves? Is that enough, Jamila? I think that's enough. Okay, here we go. Let's start with some sort of norms, like setting some community norms. We're, we're a very small community, but how do we want to behave with each other in the circle right now? Like, how do we want to talk? What are some rules that we should have when we're speaking in the circle here? So you don't want me, no raising hands and calling on. Perfect. No raising hands. It's just going to be a conversation. Just being on equal footing with each other. What does that mean, being on good footing? Um, like equal footing, like someone doesn't seem better than the other. Uh, we're just talking, like, out of, not out of context, but like regular conversation that doesn't have any um, roles to it. Um, but I feel like it shouldn't be like a teacher student conversation. I feel like it's like, a more casual conversation, mm -hmm. you say. And, yeah, the teacher's dinner really is important, but I feel like also a uh, type of friendship. Yeah, I'd like to agree with what she said. That uh, we should like speak each other like as if we're the same, like, okay. like positively. Okay. Each other and um, don't assume uh, another person like based on anything about them. Make no assumptions. That's always a good one, right? Don't assume stuff. For me. I just want to keep it informal, like it's a casual conversation and those topics that we will get through, mm -hmm. uh, they can act like icebreakers probably. So in this clip, what we really wanted you to focus on is the invisible principles, not necessarily the process. So we're really curious if anyone is just willing to share how this teacher showed up with her students and what invisible principles are informing the move she is making in this case. So I noticed she was circling up. <laughs> Way to use the book. Way to use the book. <laughs> um, also, she was asking questions like, what norms um, do you all think we should follow? I noticed her reflecting back what the kids were saying a lot or, or paraphrasing it. Yeah. And I love those three things. What do you think she was holding that led her to do those things? What principles might she have had that we couldn't really see? So she was affirming what kids were saying, repeating back to them. She was circling up, right? What is she holding? Might she be holding? <laughs> I think she's just holding a space for them to be vulnerable and to be brave and share in, um, what they've all agreed to be like a non-bias and a friendship kind of way. So they know that whatever they share at that table is going to be received 
in a friendly manner, not as a teacher role, but they were really hoping to break down some barriers there. I also think that the teacher is trying to share power with the student. So being all in a more similar level, or maybe in the same level of power. Thank you, Rafa. And I'm going to pick up on what you and Amanda shared and just kind of pull out the simplicity of what you all are mentioning. Mentioning Simple rule for her design principle might be create the space to share power. That might be a simple principle or nurture a space of vulnerability, right? Just some things that this person might be holding as they're with their group of students so that they're holding themselves accountable to really be in the space that they say they want to be in as they reimagine. It's really easy for us to revert back in our practice as well. So thank you for that. And it just reminded me, I wanted to make a connection to the case study that um, Shane shared last week with how the design principles kind of make um, us think about epistemology. And so Shane, if you can go to the next slide, we were talking about the response to the Abbotsford situation and the ways of being that people could choose. And so when you saw the Western ways of being on this right side, performative expertise is value. So a design principle somebody could have is like, talk to those who have expertise, right? Center expertise mm -hmm. could be a design principle. Whereas when I think about indigenous ways of being, it might be stay calm and thoughtful, like stay calm. That way, whatever comes out is okay. It's less about like a, a specific thing. So I just see kind of a connection there between epistemology. They don't always exactly match, but I want you all to think about this as ways of being. You all wanna hold as team members as you go into this reimagined phase. And so with that, I wanna give you all an opportunity, thank you Shane for putting it in the Padlet, to go and be with your team and to think about in a breakout room, what two to three design principles you might want to hold as you go into reimagine. We'll talk about how we're gonna reimagine afterward, but first we just want you to think about with all the data we've had, what we've heard from our kids, what seems to be really important to them that we need to commit to in terms of design principles as we do this work. You'll both, um, both teams just need one person to write on the Padlet, I think, for the two to three principles you come up with, and then you will come back and then both teams will share. So if you wanna choose someone who will share on behalf of your team, that's great, but we are gonna send you into your teams to do that. Before I open the rooms, just a real-time technical wondering I have is, I think we can't record in the breakout rooms, but that makes me think that one team, if you want, could volunteer to stay in this room. And if you're willing, have the conversation you have about design principles recorded, which would be part of the teaching mm. series. Is what? there, I know it's kind of putting you on the spot, but it would one team be up for that, staying in the main room for being recorded? At least say volunteering. <laughs> Okay. All right. So when I open this, um, the BVHM team, you can, you'll choose into your own breakout room. You can try to record it. I don't think it'll work, but see if it's possible, <laughs> but otherwise we'll keep recording in this room and they'll have about 12 minutes. Is that right, Jamila? Yes. 10 to 12. Yep. Okay. All right. We'll see you back in 12. Okay. And we will not be interrupting your team. So Shane, do you want, should we stay on camera? I think I'll go off camera. So you guys have okay. space. Okay. okay. Hi, um, given the hard work and nature of the team who did this, I will be the quiet recorder <laughs> as I volunteered us to be recorded. So uh, that's my confidence in you. Well, should we just feed off of what was shared right back then in that last little session? I really like the whole like the balance of sharing power and creating a really authentic, genuine, safe space as a design principle. You know, sitting sitting in circles and circling up, it's using that more and more. It's so powerful. And when the kids actively say, like, no one's better than anyone else, everyone has something worth sharing, um, even just noticing, like, emotions and anxiety, like, plummets almost instantly. They don't have that same level of concern sharing. Like, it's just freed up the space. And I think they feel a lot more heard and a lot more powerful in their voices. I don't know. So I like that as a design principle. I can't stop thinking about our conversation yesterday about and how she was like really holding on to some of those 
negative experiences and so circling up with a different connotation of just like always revisiting and making sure that students feel heard problems feel solved like ongoing dialogue potentially as the design mm -hmm. principle yeah I think that's valuable especially if that's perhaps the first time that they're being vulnerable to an adult in the school so just re reconnecting with them a few days later yeah, I agree. Just to build off that, I pulled from that slide from the Abbotsford, the Indigenous ways of being and just that relationality is key because I think that we're feeling that as we get into these empathy interviews that they're opening up and they're engaging if we have that relationship, right? And I guess this kind of goes along with the create space to share power, but just really intentionally going in to listen. Um, so as much as possible, like it, she gave, like in that video, she gave them the space right away to share. So doing, yeah, doing our best to, to give them the space first and foremost, and just to be a listening partner. I really like the language that she used. Like she didn't use the, she followed up and used rules, but she said community norms. Like that's just a very neutral, lovely, like tone and words. And we were talking yesterday about how certain words really can, you know, set off certain kids and, you know, just, you know, the words that we use really can have either a very positive or very detrimental um, effect. Yeah, Amanda, you made me think about the first people's principles and just like the identity piece. So valuing identity, like these kids are telling us things about themselves, like thinking about my own interview, like I'm a friend to all and like, well, I'm a slow responder, whatever the word was that had used. But like, if that's their identity, then just like, I hear you, I see you, mm -hmm. I accept you. Yeah, because we talked about hearing that with too, that desire for inclusiveness across the board, right? And just seeing them as humans. Mm -hmm. Wanting to be acknowledged. Yeah. We gonna have to pare this down to two or three. <laughs> I think that we have brought up that deep listening numerous times in our conversations yesterday and today that it, I'm seeing a pattern in all of us recognizing. So that could be... A, one of our starred ones. Thank you all for going there. You all, both of these groups came up with some wonderful design principles and we wanna hear what you all came up with as a team. So if you are the person sharing, we want to hear maybe two to three that feel really important to you. If you feel like you wanna share all of them, you can. Um, but I'll give you about 90 seconds to share what your team came up with. Who's going first? Actually, since I didn't get to hear the other group, why don't we have BBHM go first? <laughs> yeah, sure for BBHM. Well, we were discussing or you know, talking most of the time about two different aspects that we consider important. Uh, the fact of, you know, the, the fact of listening, listening deeply, listening differently than we normally, the way you know, the way normally listen to the student and about, you know, and other part of the community, of other uh, members of the community. Um, that came from, you know, from the empathy interviews that open our eyes and our mind. Uh, and we are starting to understand, you know, we have to approach to reality in a different way, you know, not, not so formal. Um, and the other aspect that we, we discussed was also, uh, well, I mean, going back again to the first one, uh, is that, uh, that, that connect with the human, I mean, students, um, are not just a student, are people, the same as, you know, the same as everyone else. Um, we have to work on that on that field don't forget about the you know the technicality of the, the we are the teacher you are the student or with the parents or the administration all these you know roles 
but sometimes uh, impede us to, to see, you know, what we really have in front of us. And the other thing is it, related also with this, that is, um, uh, uh, don't be afraid of, you know, you know the, the messiness of the process um, and work out without, uh, with that idea that we have to be vulnerable if, if we want to achieve something. I really enjoy the caterpillar butterfly um, um, signal because uh, <clears throat> I was, you know, imagining in my in my mind uh, from a big, a small caterpillar to a big caterpillar. Yes, there's an improvement, but there's not really a lot of, you know, they probably don't feel vulnerable. Feel more coffee, but that's it. But at the moment that they change and they transform to a kind of a, a, a beautiful butterfly. That is the whole reality change. And I think that's the key thing. I mean, we have to go through that process. It's painful and it's difficult. And we have to be brave, but I think we have to. All right, Rafa, thank you for sharing, BBHM. I appreciate it. And CNB, what about two maybe that stand out for you all? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Um, Thank you so much for sharing, uh, Rafa. I think we really connected on that level of definitely deeper listening. So uh, one of our principles being intentional to listen and giving students space to share, um, also connecting with the Indigenous uh, principles and ways of knowing it's just um, allowing that space for students and just being there to listen. I think that's um, something that is very important to us. Um, and then, I think for us, of course, it's really important to get the information and data from students to understand better their experiences, but also having this process be about relationship building so that that trust is developing. Um, so having, um, you know, having these conversations continue um, for multiple weeks or months throughout the year to make sure that that relationship is um, being fostered uh, as a part of the process as well, um, I think uh, are, are the ones that stand out most to me. Thank you, Lauren. Oh, Shane, this is so lovely to watch. I love how you all are orienting to the design principles and and bonus points that you came up with them too and we're able to stay on task <laughs> to be hard sometimes. so we appreciate those and i think these can really guide you all as we get to this next phase so i'm going to turn it over to you shane to kind of start moving us toward reimagining and before i go back to the slides i think these are just so beautiful and an invitation to find a visual way to have them with you when you mm -hmm. continue through the journey whether it's on an agenda or your cogen plan. And a second invitation to think about if you can um, put these into student-friendly language as an end of cogen or end of empathy interview assessment. Did you feel like scale of one to five, how well did you feel I listened to you today? Um, you know, did you feel that we developed more trust through this interaction? Like really you can continually, right? Get that street data and now you have some authentic language that matters to you to be able to do that around. Okay, so for our final part of today, I wanna to make sure I'm in the right part of the slides. Um, our goal is to try to set you up to launch a cogen. And we kind of went back and forth on whether this seemed like too ambitious and crazy or the right thing to do. And so I'm just gonna be transparent and say that we are here learning with you, <laughs> trying to figure out what the right kind of, um, you know, grain size, action size, like thing to try is. And we just landed on cogens because they're so, they're so pedagogical, they're so classroom facing, they're so, I think, actionable and practical. And even if it feels challenging to do it the first time, I think it's one of those practices that over time will just become really intrinsic. And it'll like, you'll wanna just keep doing it and it won't take as much um, work. So we want, I wanna set you up in this last part to try a cogen. Um, just a note that this is written about in chapter eight, page 178. It's one of the featured practices here. And in just a moment, I'm gonna share with you a tool that actually further breaks down beyond the text, um, how kind of the, the process, like how to go through um, a cogen. And again, this is within reimagine. And now we're thinking about what does it look like to do this reimagining work with 
our students, right? With the young people we care about and have been listening to and talking with. Okay, so we're gonna go back to the video and the first part that I will share with you is a little riff from our friend, Dr. Chris Emden. Um, if folks know his work, he wrote um, for white folks who teach in the hood and the rest of y'all too. And then more recently he published a book called Ratchedemic and he wrote, of course, the foreword to Street Data, which I just think is a gorgeous piece of writing. And um, you're going to hear him talk a little bit about cogens because this idea came out of his first book. So we wanted to attribute to him, but also he speaks just so powerfully about the origins of it. So just listen for kind of the what at this point. So we're kind of wrapping our heads together around what this protocol, this process, this tool is and where it comes from. Cogenerative dialogues, for me, you know, they're birthed out of Again, street data. I, I, you know, I didn't have the language to describe this stuff until y'all wrote this dope ass book. You know, um, you, you know, I, I would look at young folks in hip hop ciphers, and I would watch them position themselves in circle, equidistant from each other. Um, one person rhyming, one person finishing another sentence. This really deep listening to each other, beats in the backdrop to create a rhythm to the conversation. Collective effervescence when everybody finished each other's sentences. And at the end of it, they all became family and they were preparing for the next time they would meet. And I said to myself, the cipher is such an organic, generative way to engage in conversation and create community and get instant feedback about how you're performing or not. How amazing would it be if young folks can do ciphers in classrooms? And I, I didn't have the language to describe it as cipher, but the but then we started utilizing for a framework from Ken Tobin, my doctor advisor, and some other folks. We were working. I was like, yo, this cogenerative dialogue, if we structure it like a cipher, have kids in the class give feedback to each other and their teacher about how they're experiencing the learning. And then not only just giving them feedback, but then saying, let's co-generate a plan of action for fixing that thing. And so the beauty of cogenerative dialogue is that it's a practice that everyone can implement. But the results of the dialogue will vary based on your school. That's street data. I knew I wanted, uh, this was an opportunity to talk to kids and to, to hear their voices. So I went to the quietest corners of the room and I picked the four kids um, uh, from whom I have heard the fewest number of words since the beginning of the year. And those were these students. And I've given them surveys, feedback surveys. I gave a survey to sort of do a map, map level, Shane calls it map level data. Um, and ask them questions about my pedagogy, about classroom culture, about being part of a team. And under the teamwork category, a couple of them were, my question was, do you feel like you're part of a team? Do you feel like we are part of a community? Uh, do you feel comfortable with the people you're with? And three of the four kids were like, not so much. So that was another way that I selected the kids for the cogen. So I'm gonna open it up to you all just to share anything that stood out to you or that excites you about this idea. Um, I'm going to share one more clip at first pause just to chew that content together and hear from you. It stood out from Chris's description um, and or how Gwen talks about it with respect to her class. Jessica says family, the word family. I love that. Trying to create a different kind of dynamic with students, right? That's more personal, connected. What else stood out or excites you about this? Okay, I'll go again, sorry. Um, I love, so we're constantly taught, um, you know, reflective practice, but how often do we go back to the stakeholders and back to the kids to say, how did I do? We sit in our own minds and our own reflections, like how do I think it went? Going back to the kids to getting their authentic survey and then that, that would be really, really cool. I love that. Thank you for that. And I think that's tying back to Jamila's quote about the caterpillar, right? That's the opportunity for transformation. So if we do the deep listening, but then we only rely on our own schema or our adult collaborative to redesign and reimagine, there's just naturally limitations, right? And so here we're letting go of being the experts as Jamila described. And we're saying, we're gonna be able to do this better in partnership with you all. You're gonna have some ideas that we can't really imagine right now. Um, let's see in the chat, Elise says, deliberately going to the margin. She selected the quietest students, yep. Aaron, being vulnerable to hear that what you're doing might not be working for students. And the reason, just frankly, that I chose Gwen for this video is because she's like a master teacher. Y'all can probably tell. She was my project-based learning coach 20 years ago. 
And she's still like trying to fit, you know, improve and transform her practice. She's still trying to get better and she still finds these places and spaces to, to transform. So I love that about it. Okay, so I'm gonna share one more whoops, clip and then the tool, I'm gonna do this backwards. So this, this final clip is um, the part of the cogen that Gwen's doing where she's now trying to, um, she's done a circle with the kids. We saw some of that earlier. And now she's trying to get from them, like, what should we be working on, right? They're brainstorming. What's potentially an instructional issue, right, or challenge in the classroom that we could work on? And I just want you to notice again um, how she approaches that as a teacher. Like, what are her facilitator moves? Um, and then kind of how that might connect to some of your design principles that you just came up with. Here we go. Your goal with the first cogen is to land on a focused instructional issue to work on with your students over approximately four or five weeks. That said, I recommend that you begin with an open-ended brainstorm of possible instructional issues to work on before narrowing down to one. You can use a whiteboard or post-its to ask students to help you generate ideas for focus areas. Ultimately, the narrower the focus, the better, because you want to create a sense of efficacy by seeing real growth and movement in a short amount of time. Okay, people are gonna hate me for this. I feel like people are already, I can already hear the, the complaints. <laughs> presentations are like the only way to get people talking if they do presentations. And I'm not saying it has to be mandatory, but I think having people actually do presentations, like Leilani, your presentation was great. So if you could just make more presentations, if, if we had more presentations or like if we actually presented the projects, then um, that would be that would uh, that would be a way to get other people speaking and the five people would kind of have to speak. I know it's kind of, it sounds kind of mean, but it's true. It's, that's how you do I, it. I agree you because know. in actual like real life, we're going to have to communicate with many people and create allies through many things. And um, we're going to have to learn communication skills skills if we like it or not mm -hmm. because I mean it's a core part of right. our society as people right it sounds like we're kind of gravitating towards these two right this one how how to get more kids it sounds like you're already brainstorming possible answers to this so this one and then how to share the spotlight like Leilani's you know put forward so I think those two kind of go together like can we make those our goal for this for this meeting to brainstorm okay Okay, that's our final clip for today, but again, you'll have access to the whole 12 minute video. Um, so anything before we transition into sharing the tool and just giving you a little um, space to think on your own, anything else stand out here or ways you could see this connecting to your design principles? I just think this whole process connects to our design principle of like, don't be afraid for it to get messy. Um, Cause I, I hear like, hearing like the feedback from students could be like very like hard for I know for me and you know taking in their suggestions into the classroom could also be messy and I know I'm one that I like structure um and um it might not be there <laughs> um yeah that first I love that Anna that was the next part of the video is um the person making the video told me to talk about how vulnerable it can be and how you can feel triggered and defensive right depending on what kids say so I'm so glad you named that and you'll see that in the video too okay then I want to give you some time to regroup so if you check this is both in the agenda and now in the chat there's a cogen tool that I think you also are the first group that we've really used this with although we built it a while ago um but it's just this process is a little complicated, so we wanted to have time to kind of unpack it like we're doing today. And so I want to give you a few minutes to just kind of be with this tool, which over gives an overview of the process. I do want to say for um, the admin who are here, I mean, you may want to go through this as well. You may want to use this same process with, you know, around school culture, right? With our BC colleagues have been really grappling with like behavior and how do we deal with some of the kids who are like acting out and struggling. And so you could totally do this. And then of course, teachers, you're focusing on a practice. You're thinking about a classroom level issue. Um, so spend a few minutes with this. And the lens here is to be thinking um, just frankly about, you know, who you would tap um, when you would have a first meeting. Our, our invitation is to try to have one cogen meeting before we regroup, which is like May 11th. So it's about three plus weeks from now. 
So to think about who and to gather those students for the first time, like you saw Gwen doing, um, between now and when we meet again. So you have that data to bring back. And I think I'll just be quiet for a few minutes and then we'll have a chance to share and kind of cross pollinate what ideas are coming up. Jamila, anything you want to add here? Yeah, just adding that for hopefully some of the kids you choose are the ones that you've started to work with and your listen and uncover. Um, and really one of the most, I think, valuable pieces of this is it's the going back, right? So you listened to me and you've got my thoughts on what my experience is. And now what are you going to do about, uh, about it? Well, you're going to reimagine with me. Okay. <laughs> I feel like you're really listening to me and you care about my thoughts. So I think if you definitely start with the kids that you've already spoken to, maybe it might shift, you know, and maybe there's a broader group, but I certainly would encourage you all to think about that. Um, Cause we want them to be the people who hold us accountable or measure our success at the end of it. So thank you. So we wanted to open it up for some comments before we do the formal close and just ask you all, how are you feeling about this reimagine piece of, you know, launching a code den as a way to really engage and design with um, and any questions that are coming up about how to do this. We really want to set you up to feel um, confident, not that it's going to be perfect, but that you can do it, that you can try it and dive in. So how are you feeling and what questions are emerging for you? I'm going to say my big question is it says like not to choose students or people you feel an affinity with, but it also seems like you need some level of trust. And so I was just struggling with thinking about that a little bit and how to choose the, the people so that they will participate essentially, especially if we're thinking of kids. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. That's a great question. What's the language on the tool about affinity? I don't even remember that part. <laughs> what does it say? Don't tap only students you have an affinity or like relationship with, I think. Okay, I think the spirit of that is you, it's like, we, it's like the problem in many schools where the only students we listen to are the students on student council, right? Like, I feel like that's a paradigm. That's a trap and trope of its own. So I think the provocation is not to, not to choose students you have no relationship with necessarily, but to resist the urge to only pull the kids that feel comfortable to talk to, right? Or that you feel like you've already built a whole bunch of relational trust with. Like you might choose one or two of those kids, but also some of the ones that you're struggling with more, you're trying to transform that relationship, right? Thanks for that question, it's a great question. Other folks, how are you feeling and what questions are coming up? Yeah, um, I feel excited to try something new and to continue to listen to the students. Um, but I do feel a little anxious, um, definitely like about the timing, like, oh, when am I, you know, like, oh, okay, in the mornings, once a week. And um, yeah, just having enough time. Um, that makes complete sense. Just to again, manage, narrow the expectations a little bit. It, between now and when we see each other again, it's just trying to do one, just to start it. So it might be that you do it May 10th or May 8th or whatever, um, but to get the ball kind of moving and then we can come back here and talk about how did it go? What felt difficult? How, what do we do next? Don't feel like you have to accomplish the entire cycle in the next three weeks. Anybody else wanna share before we move to close? Well, I, I'd like to say, well, I had a, a nice conversation with Lauren. Um, she mentioned a couple of things that I, was thinking, you know, similarly. Uh, one was uh, we were wondering about uh, the dynamic of, a, of a student, the, the student in this, in those groups, in these kind of groups. I and mean, because uh, sometimes students at the margins have a completely different agenda, some mentalities, and dynamics, and put it all together. Uh, I mean, could work. Well, maybe not. Uh, so we were talking about that this is a process. Um, this is just try and see how it goes. But it feels it feels a little, you know, um, not very firm soil. Um, but this is what it is. So I'm happy with that. You know. Mm -hmm. 
And the second thing is similar to that, um, how well prepared we, do we need to be? I mean, because we're too much prepared, that sounds like this is just, we're following, you know, something, a script or something similar, but, and it shouldn't be like that, it's more like a conversation. So we're wondering, you know, uh, what is that point that we feel that we are enough, you know, in our mm. preparedness? That's a good question. Yeah. I mean, I would encourage you all, if you can, to meet again as a team in the next week or two and to think about, especially that second question, right? Like, is there a baseline of structure, you know, some common questions we want to ask? You have an agenda and the tool, right? But you don't need to follow it lockstep. All of this is adaptive work, right? So you get to you get to hybridize that, you get to adapt and change that and make it yours. Um, and we trust you, you know, you're here for a reason. So you all are going to have things you can inject and infuse into that that'll make it different and, and really local. Um, but I think that would be a great question to, to ask the team together. If you're able to maybe all watch the video, I'll look at the tool and then kind of come back together in a week or so. But Shane, sure. if you don't mind me just adding a, a couple of things about that, because I know like th it's a thing you have, you have to make happen. First of all, I would offer just to both of your teams if you want a time to just ask questions more thoroughly to help you structure it, I I think we're happy to create that space for you. So just email and then we'll make a time to do that. And then the second thing is that um, for each of you all, you don't have to go so big. So you both have things you're focused on. Student engagement is one for BBHM. I can't remember the one for a CBN, but you both have areas. So you can start with that area and say, I'm trying to think about how to improve student engagement. You know what I mean? You can just say that, right? And say, I'm trying to figure out how to do that. What's an issue that we might solve together, right? It doesn't have to be like, here's this thing that we're doing. The video is just super sexy. That's what, you know what I mean? But when you get to it, you can bring the stakes way down, right? And give them the frame of what you've been working on. Help me figure out an issue and let's just go crazy on this chart paper. And that's, you know, that's and let them go. And then, you know, beside that, when they, if they get off track, just do what you do as a teacher. You better sit yourself down and get back to this conversation we having right now. You know, like read whatever you do to redirect kids. It's, it's bring, bring it down, just let it flow. And we're available if you need help. Thanks, Shane. <laughs> Yeah, for sure. All right, Ana Sanchez, if you could maybe set a two minute timer and share whatever witnessing happened today for you. Um, sure. Um, I felt like today was very much a day of learning and processing. And so I wanna just name a couple of things that I thought were really powerful. I thought starting with a reflection, like starting to think, uh, how are we already starting this learning process and thinking about our own transformation was really um, helpful. And then um, I really appreciated, or actually I think everyone really appreciated the image of the caterpillar and butterfly. I heard multiple people bringing that up again and again. So I think having that anchor image really supported people's learning and also their conversations. Um, noticed a bunch of different ways at, at BVHM, one of our norms is respecting different learning styles. And there was a bunch of ways to learn. Like there was a Padlet, there was a video, there was, conversations, there were dyads, um, so whole group conversations. So I think all those different formats allowed for folks to process in their own way and to gain access. Um, I noticed that different people were speaking up at different times, like not every time it was like, every time we had to speak, a different person went first. Um, I felt like we were more vulnerable, um, more people asked questions. Um, and then it was nice to have that time listening with other folks from the other school so we could uh, just like cross pollinate. Um, and then I noticed that when we were bringing up the whole group conversations, we would even reference what we talked about from another site. So I just thought it was really special to hear like, oh, I heard so-and-so say, um, um, yeah, so that's it. Beautiful witnessing, Anna. Thank you so much. Give some snaps, love and appreciation for that. And Elise, I know you were off camera when you got sort of deputized for this role. Are you still okay to hold in and to share what you observed today? I actually thought Winter took it, but I can do it. No, okay, I did have Sarah to. Sarah took Sarah it. This is the backup. Sarah, do you go yeah. ahead. Sarah, do you want to do it? Yeah, I can do it. I have some notes here. Um, first, I was just noticing how like seeped we are all in this work. Um, 
like the talk less, listen more. I heard people like Jess said she's becoming a better listener and Rafa when he was um, reviewing what CVHM had come up with for their, um, sorry, for their design principles, listening was in there and CNB listening was in there. And then the repetition of transformation, like Anna S just mentioned it now in her witnessing, um, somebody called it like a mental shift and then that everyone just like attaching to that butterfly caterpillar metaphor. Um, it just shows how much we're really like living in this text. I also noticed the vulnerability like Anna did. I noticed a lot of like sighing and people are doing more hand motions. So I think it's just like the emotional connection we've all got to this work. It's like coming out very physically for all of us. Um, and then the fun thing, like we're all in this together. When someone's talking, I see other people nodding and smiling and thumbs up. So that like uh, Araceli saying, like going back to the heart and everyone's like, yes, like, amen, you know? <laughs> um, and even at an age, like I like structure and all the teachers were like, yes, we're <laughs> with you. So that was cool. Um, wait time by our fearless leaders I think that really encouraged more conversation different people speaking so thank you for that and then last like funny little thing because I'm a scribbler I noticed my other scribbler and note takers out there Anna Lauren Amanda Jess Veronica Erin <laughs> I feel yeah Oh my goodness, the two of you just crushed it. Such beautiful, like whole body listening and witnessing. Thank you both for playing that role today. It's really nice to have different people witness, right? Because we all bring a different flavor and style to it. All right, in full closure, um, your homework is again to read the Pedagogy of Voice, or review that if you've read it, and do the flip grid. We extended that for a week. So if you can. It'd be really nice to have each of your voices captured on that flip grid and it's just kind of that current state reflection on the instructional practices that you've been thinking about in this project. Um, and then as far as the cogen to watch the video um, you've seen already about half of it, so you can watch just the pieces you haven't seen if you'd like debrief as a team and then do your best to do a first cogen with a group of students um, before we meet again on May 11th. And uh, you can record that, you can audio record it, you could video record it, or you could just take notes. Um, I don't think we were, we had a super strong preference around that, but it would be great to bring back the data in some way, whatever kind of feels appropriate to you and your students. And we'll close with Dr. Love's words that were on the agenda. Jamila, do you wanna read this? This came from chapter two. Sure, since chapter two, um, it's from the illustrious Bettina Love, who says abolitionists, want to remove what is oppressive, not reform it, not reimagine it, but remove oppression by its roots. Abolitionists want to understand the conditions that normalize oppression and uproot those conditions too. Abolitionists, in the words of scholar and activist Bill Ayers, demand the impossible and work to build a world rooted in the possibilities of justice. So as we think about this cogen, we are all centered in possibility, grounded in the roots, and those roots really were uncovered by you all through the conversations you all have had with your students. So go out, do those cogens, and get to the brainstorming. I want you guys to come back with all the like ideas that the kids had. Just make your circle and figure out your issue, but get to the brainstorm. Just let them go wild. We can structure it later, okay? We can structure it later, but let them go. Come back with some stuff. <laughs> Come back with some stuff. That's your sign. <laughs> I think you all are amazing. You are my heroes and sheroes. And thank you for continuing to lean in so beautifully to this work. We really appreciate you and we'll see you in a few weeks. Bye.